My family came to Woodstock in 1948. Um, my mother was born in Ellenville in 1920, and I was born in Ellenville in 1946. My father was from Yonkers, uh, but he had relatives in Ellenville. So my mother and my father did have, both had Ellenville connect, connections, although my father was 12 years older than she was, so they didn't meet as children. But later they had um, aunts, they each had aunts from Ellenville who introduced them at the Hotel Woodstock in 1943. My mother was just out of college. She graduated from Carnegie Tech um, with a BFA in drama. My father was between ships in the Merchant Marine. Um, so they hit it off and got married a year later. I was born in Ellenville, but my father wasn't happy in Ellenville. Um, it was too stifling for him. My mother had worked at the Woodstock Playhouse. She had this degree in drama, and after she graduated, she spent a summer or two at the Playhouse here. Also, my father's aunts had visited here in the 20s and 30s and were much taken with the Woodstock dresses and everything. So Woodstock was part of their vocabulary, and they decided it seemed like a, a good place to try. To live, it seemed like it had all the beauty of the country, and yet it was sophisticated and uh, free thinking and was a more interesting community, they thought, than Ellenville. And they felt that way for always. They loved Woodstock. So we first moved, um, our first house was in Birdcliff. It was Bolton Brown's house, Carniola, that burned down in 1965. But we were only there in the summer, the first summer. And right away, um, the aesthetics of Woodstock hit me like a ton of bricks, even though I was only three years old. Because our family home in Ellenville was a beautiful Victorian white house, very proper and clean and respectable and everything. And Bolton Brown's house was just as wonderful, but in a totally different way. It was all open, open windows, big fireplace, big staircase, rooms to hide in rambling house, um, a lot of freedom. Um, so I loved it there. And what I did for fun was I played the Victrola and listened to Woody Guthrie songs. We walked and identified all the wildflowers. And it was absolutely beautiful then as it is now, only it was more beautiful then, more aesthetic then. Um, you could just feel it. And I've read that Jane Whitehead was a great aesthete and took it very seriously and studied all about it. And I think she did an excellent job, if it's her influence that shows at Birdcliff. Besides the, the beauty of the vistas and everything, it's a naturally beautiful place. Um, but it was, it's just, uh, it was magical there. When did your parents start the store? My parents, um, well, I have to correct myself here. I said in the book that they founded the Catskill Art Supply Store, but actually um, they didn't. They, um, they bought a partnership with the Dordics, and then a few years later in 1955, well, they, they bought a partnership in 1955. They bought out the Dordics and the Burling, Dick Burling game in 1958, changed the name to Twine's Bookshop, and then had it for the next 20 years. Well, the store changed over the years, mainly in the merchandise. Um, I believe my father expanded the art supplies, catering to the Art Students League students in the Woodstock School of Art, which later became the Woodstock School of Art. My mother was very much into the books and loved ordering them and um, liked to speculate as to what would be a big seller, and she had a lot of fun with that. They had records also. The records weren't very successful. And eventually, when my father was temporarily indisposed, my mother sold the records. So we were down to um, books and art supplies, cards, beautiful prints and posters. Um, it was a nice mom and pop, warm, friendly place. They bought the bookstore in 1955. And they retired from the bookstore in 1978. So they had worked very hard there. They had a long history there. 
they met a lot of interesting people who would just come through the day, come through their lives every day, sort of like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood it was fun. My impression of the artists varied according to the artist. Some of them were a lot of fun and very friendly and funny, and others were grouchy, and I would kind of hide when I saw them coming. Um, some were like, had that typical artistic temperament, you know, of um, throwing the brushes around and being very angry if you didn't have their proper shade of white. Um, and others were just funny and would come in and chat. Growing up in the store was uh, fun. You always had someone to talk to. And um, the dogs were welcome. The, the people who worked in the store were friendly, wonderful people. Dorothy LaCasse, Cornelia Rosenblum, um, James Gibson later. We had many people of all different ages working at different times. Mindy Dunham. And it was fun. We would sometimes watch the gong show at lunchtime, or we'd go to Dewey's for lunch and come back with takeout and watch the gong show. Or my father had football games on in the fall. Uh, Robert Angelock would come in in the morning before teaching his class at the Art Students League <coughs> to have his coffee and just chat. The, the political views ranged widely you know, from intensely anti-communist to communist and everything in between. So it was all very interesting. Um, Woodstock always had a very free, very open, free expression attitude. You know, you, you were free to think and say what you liked, and that's what was so unique about Woodstock. Well, when I was 10 years old, I mainly was in the way. Um, sometimes I would talk to the customers and my father would say, don't annoy the customers, dear. So I had to just kind of crawl into a little hole somewhere. But later, um, I grew to work there. I would um, dust the books and arrange the, the paints in the right slots and um, filed. I did filing in the office. Um, I arranged posters. My favorite job was to like decorate the place. My mother was into changing the, the scenery all the time. I remembered something else about how I felt about the artists. Looking around at some of the um, pictures, uh, they were just regular people. Now in retrospect, as we're having shows of their work and, and honoring them, they're, they're celebrities. But in those days, they were just people. You know, I didn't, um, I wasn't taking notes. Do you have a favorite store-related story? Well, just the funny one of my father's partner, Dick Burlingame, climbing out the back room window when he saw a lady coming up that kind of admired him romantically and he was trying to avoid her. So that was kind of amusing. Um, a favorite story was, um, the record's getting dusty. I had a favorite record cover by Julie London. It was called Misty. And I said, Mom, Misty's getting pretty dusty. And she thought that was funny. So we just had fun. You know, my stories and recollections are more sweet little moments than, you know, earth-shaking events. I grew up, um, well, the first summer was in Birdcliff, and then we moved down to the valley and lived on Tinker Street in, um, right next to the Van Wagnons. And I was an only child. There weren't any other kids up in Birdcliff, so I was kind of starved for society. And my mother said, go make friends. And some kids ran by. She said, go outside and make friends with them. Go, go. And it was Ross and Jay Van Wagnon running lickety split through the backyard. So I said, hey, 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 can I be your friend? And um, the Van Wagnons have been a major force in Woodstock always and still are. It's funny. They were the first people I met. Okay, we were there for a year or so and then we moved to the house where I still live today on Juniper Lane. It was a restaurant when my parents bought it. It was called Green Gate and before that it was Hungarian Gardens. The Hekaroths had their wedding reception there 
Edith Heckeroth told me. At one time, it was quite the swing in place. Anyhow, I remember having dinner there on the porch. We ate and dined on the porch, and I loved it. And it had a bar. My parents bought it. They were going to run a restaurant, but changed their minds. They thought better of it, wisely, I think, and then made the big mistake of removing the bar. So I've regretted that. I always wish I had just a bar in the living room. But anyway, so we lived there, and I've always been very comfortable there, always loved it there, have always had chickens and horses, no more, but then, and cats and dogs and all kinds of animals. What was it like growing up in Woodstock? It was the best thing ever. Um, I can't think of, uh, I was so lucky, we were all so lucky. The Kardashians couldn't reproduce it. They wouldn't know what to do. There was so much fresh air and freedom, freedom to, we would ride our horses through the woods and tie them up and swim in the Sawkill. We'd spend our summers on the Apple Rock, lying in the sun and talking and hanging out. And then we'd ride home through the woods to dinner. Um, our imaginations were running wild. The pileated woodpeckers sounded like um, jungle birds. And there was a, a song, Quiet Village, that was popular, or instrumental at the time. And I wouldn't think of Quiet Village while riding through that um, South American rainforest that was Como. And it was just, there wasn't, you couldn't imagine anything better. And, um, and one, of, what, one of the greatest things that's happened in Woodstock in my experience was the town voting to buy Como and keeping it and preserving it for the town because I had so much happy times here, so many wonderful times riding my horse around Como and through the woods and getting to the stream through here. And the riding club was right across the stream on the other side, so I, had, I would ride through the woods, <clears throat> through everyone's backyard, down to um, 212, cross the street, come up here to Como, and then cross the stream to the riding club. That was the route. Did a lot of kids have horses? Quite a few, yeah, I had quite a few friends who did. Um, Nikki Ketchum, Larry Webster, the Green Girls, um, Lloydie and Emmy Gibson, and Jimmy Gibson. Yeah, quite, there were a lot more horses than there are now. Now there aren't any, because it's dangerous to ride on the roads now. So but it was great. Horses were a big part of your life. Yeah, they were a big part of my life, yes. Let me see, when was it? The 70s or the 80s? 80s. It was the 80s um, when the, the possibility arose of purchasing Como for the town. Um, I remember, um, wow, I was already working for the Woodstock Times, I think, because I knew Rick Jacob, the planner from Ulster County, who would come here and look around with Paul Van Wagnon, who was on the Woodstock planning board. And um, I remember riding my horse one day, and they were here. And you know, I said, oh, you have to get this property. We have to get it. And they said, we're working on it. We're trying. Besides horses, what did you do for fun as a kid growing up? Um, ice skated in the winter. I loved to ice skate. Um, well, we'd walk to town and have sodas at the news shop or Charlie's Ice Cream Parlor. I mean, when rock and roll came in, that was a, a, a lot of fun. That was exciting, because um, Charlie's had a jukebox. Where else would we be able to hear anything with the reception around here? Um, let's see, what did we do? I read, I read books. I read every Nancy Drew there ever was. I read a Louisa May Alcott and, and all those books, Little Men, Little Women, the little colonel, everything. I went to Woodstock Elementary School following um, preschool at the Tinker Street Cooperative, which my mother had had a hand in um, starting. It was the mothers took turns uh, helping the teacher. And, uh, but most of my friends, just as the year was beginning, 
defected to Mary D's, which was the more upscale artistic preschool. So I feel I kind of missed out uh, on the preschool level. But after that, we all met again in kindergarten at Woodstock. What year was that? 1951. It was the second year that the school was operating. It opened, I think, in 1950. We called it the big school, and um, I was there 1951. I went to high school at Onteora. That was, uh, nothing was ever simple around here. There was a big school fight before I could go to determine whether Woodstock was going to join the Onteora district or the Kingston district. My father was rabidly pro-Onteora. And the town was quite divided, but you could see, the same, just as it is today, uh, people's alliances would shift according to the issue. So while you might have some Democrats very closely rooting for Adlai Stevenson, they'd be on opposite sides of the fence when it came to the school question. Um, but anyway, my father was very outspoken about the whole thing to the point that some kids in school teased me, and I overheard them saying, I hate Twine's guts. Not me, but my father. So I went home and told them I'm being picked on. And he said, well, we'll get you up to Antioch right now, honey. So he took, he took me to a meeting of the school board, <clears throat> introduced me to Edna Hoyt, who was the wheeler dealer in those days, and the school board voted that it would be okay for me to come to Antior a year early because I was being discriminated against at Woodstock. Many people influenced me as a child. For, I'd have to say my father because he was always pushing me, pushing me, pushing me uh, to do things that I was a little shy about doing. So. I'm grateful to him for that. Um, and my mother's friends, I was an only child, but my mother's friends would come over all the time and talk. And I told you she had gone to college in Pittsburgh and got her drama degree. Well, two of her fellow drama students from Carnegie Tech were Jane Bruin and Lisa Downer, who settled in Woodstock later also. Jane being from California and Lisa being from um, West Virginia, and they all settled here. And they were three wonderful women, very interesting, delightful. And um, because of my mother's friendship, friendship with Jane Brune, I became friends with the Brune family, and they were a great influence on my life, and what a help they were to me, just in terms of meeting people. Um, and their son was so smart, Hob Brune. He was an only child, too. He was like my little brother. We would hang out together um, while the adults talked. <clears throat> and I met Hob's friends in New York, and through Hob, got a job working at Columbia University in the Slavic Languages Department, and then went on to get my master's degree in theater at Teachers College. Um, I went on to start my own little puppet troupe, which lasted about six weeks. And, um, and then what did I do? I had a few jobs. I worked at IBM as a temp for a while. I was sort of at loose ends until I got a job uh, typesetting for the Woodstock Times, and one day at a morning meeting at the Woodstock Times, it was mentioned that they didn't, nobody wanted to cover the town board meetings. We couldn't get anybody to go. Well, it was practically a volunteer job anyway. But I said, oh, I'll go, oh. So that was my big break into journalism and writing. Do you have any Woodstock Times stories you'd like to share? Oh. Um, well, that's a book in itself, I guess. Rush Harp was a frequent presence. He was a friend of Getty's and would come around. Um, he, was the, he had many conspiracies at, uh, about the Kennedy assassination and all kinds of other things. He was full of intrigue. Um, let's see. It was just fun working there. Again, we worked very hard. It was back in the old days when um, it, there were no computers. We didn't have computers. We used a composer typewriter, and, um, and we worked all night long laying out the paper and pasting up the ads and everything. I worked with Spider and Anita Barbour, 
who doubled as writers and photographers and paste up people and editors too. So the Barbours would drive me home at four o'clock in the morning to my parents' house and I'd hear the rooster crowing already and uh, I loved the Woodstock Times. I had a great time there. What years did you work there? I started in 1982 and then I guess it sort of tapered off in 1889, 18, 1990. I was still working there a little bit in the 1990s, uh, but I had a health problem that required surgery, so I was out of commission for a while. Then I did some freelance writing for the Daily Freeman, and I was part of the Freeman staff that won an award from the New York Newspapers Association or something for covering Woodstock 94. I got the scoop that it was going to be at Winston Farm. I scooped Andrea because <laughs> one of the town board members clued me in. And then later, Parry, the editor, said, how did you, how did you get that story? And uh, I thought, shame on you asking me to reveal my source. <laughs> I would describe Woodstock as being the land of freedom, free expression, peace, as much love as humanly possible. Um, I think the dream of um, universal harmony, sort of the pl platonic perfection of everyone getting along and loving with each other and the lion lying down with the lamb and all that is sort of, is within reach in Woodstock or at least it's a shared vision. You feel like, you know, people feel that way. And it's non-judgmental for the most part. Um, and individuality is encouraged instead of kind of scoffed. When I went away to college, it was culture shock. I went to Ryder College in Trenton, New Jersey, and it was like being dipped in burning oil or something. I did not understand it. it the conventionality was incredible. And all the girls in the dorm, they wouldn't go to the cafeteria unless they all went together. They had to all go together. You know, anybody who wasn't with the group was something was wrong. And it was, uh, it was just a very strange, a different world than I had ever known. So while you were in college, was it always on your mind that you would return to Woodstock? Or was oh, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Yes, well, it was in my mind to return to Woodstock, but I also had a foot in New York City. I think most people in their 20s from around here feel they have to do their apprenticeship in New York City. I had to feel that I could take the subway. I had to feel that I could take the bus and find the museums and get around and function in New York City. Well, my aunt, I had relatives in the city, so on weekends I would take the bus into the city, stay with either the Bruins or my aunts, um, and just sightsee, do as much as I could, and then take the bus back to Trenton. Or if I had an extra day, I would go all the way up to Woodstock. Yeah, I always wanted to um, be in Woodstock, because even though I did enjoy the city, I missed um, the terracotta, the leaves, the, the sensual woodlands of it all, just nature. Well, the changes I've seen in town have been gradual, not, uh, not very dramatic all at once. There were a few dramatic changes like Bradley Meadows getting converted into a shopping center. That was traumatic. Gee, this was the late 60s, early 70s. There was a town, um, Bradley Meadows was a cow pasture with beautiful black and white cows at the entrance to town. That's a change. Woodstock had a very beautiful entrance to town. What with the Russell Farm on Route 375 and the landscapes, the cows, um, and then, uh, to make a long story short, Bradley Meadows was converted into the shopping center you know today as Sunflower and Citibank and Rite Aid. 
And for a while there were people who had said they would never set foot in that place, including me. Um, but I go there all the time now. Um, okay, another change was the old schoolhouse that used to sit where big, big CVS is today was moved back off the road, back farther back from the road, and then the Grand Union came in, a great big building. Um, and in 1970, wasn't it the 70s, the sidewalks came up in 1970, I don't know the exact year, but it was Val Cadden's administration, the first woman supervisor of Woodstock, and she got some kind of deal with the state to replace our sidewalks with cement. So up came the bluestone sidewalks, up came the hitching posts, and um, the little the stand the stone slabs you would stand on to get in the wagons, and um, and then we also got a, a little piece of real estate added to the village green that has ever since interrupted the traffic flow at that corner and made it highly inconvenient. Uh, that was a change. Just little things. Mowers, I thought, would always be there. The, the grocery store, the little family-owned grocery store, the news shop, which was in the center of town, I just thought it would always be there. Um, it's now a cosmetic shop. I mean, things do change. Um, but a lot has stayed the same, too. My favorite story about Woodstock is perhaps it's the, um, the misidentification as the place that, where the festival took place. This is a base canard, and it's moved our history to a parallel track from what it really is. So I feel like Hillary Clinton or something. We were, it wasn't here, and you often have to explain that. You'd think that it would be, well, why would anyone know that, you know? Um, all our publicity now is so festival-based, it obscures the real, very rich history we have in, other, in all other areas, I think. Although I love the Woodstock Festival was great for its peace and love and bringing together people in peace. That's what it was about. It was like a war protest and proving to the establishment that these young people could get together and be peaceful, to, could gather in large numbers in protest of the war and be peaceful about it. And they did and they were and it was a great occasion for that reason. As I'm thinking about what I would talk about here, I realize there's so much. I realize how rich my life has been here. And I wanted to say something that would um, sort of in, in honor of Woodstock that would kind of return some of the, the life it's given me. I know my whole personality has been deeply influenced because I was here. I wouldn't have had the same life at all if I weren't in Woodstock. And it's like a community that raises its children. Because, you know, your parents might not be artists, but there are ten of them right around the block. And, oh, I remember the sound of flamenco dancers on the wooden floor at Parnassus Square. The old Woodstock Playhouse, that's something that changed. That was such a wonderful place. Great excitement. My mother used to take me there when I was a little kid to the matinees. What's your fondest memory of the Woodstock Playhouse? Finian's Rainbow. Um, my, uh, my next door neighbor, Paul Champagnier's mother, was the pianist for the Playhouse. She played for the musicals. And one day I was over at the Champagnier's and Norma said, well, I'm going to the theater now. You want to see Finian's Rainbow? And uh, I said, sure. So she took us, and it was so exciting. Oh, my God, it was so exciting. The music, the color, the, the acting, the songs, and, and knowing Norma. And also one of my parents' friends, the Brun, was playing a part in the show. He was the sheriff. And so that was so exciting. My Paul and I were just shaking with excitement to see Woody come on the stage. 
And I always love that song, How Are Things in Glockamora? And it always reminds me of Woodstock, too. I mean, whenever I was away, oh, I'm a, whenever I traveled away, I would have these soppy emotional recollections of Woodstock along the How Are Things in Glockamora line. <laughs> 